An American bishop is removed from office by Pope Francis, but for what reason? Bishop Joseph Strickland is here to respond in an exclusive interview. Here with reaction and analysis of this and much more is the papal posse. Father Gerald Murray and Robert Royal react to the Strickland news. The world over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me an X post. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. So much to cover. This past weekend, news broke that Bishop Joseph Strickland of the Diocese of Tyler, Texas, had been removed as the leader of his diocese by Pope Francis. The Vatican issued a blunt statement on Saturday, November 11th, without giving a specific reason for the move. Needless to say, a worldwide firestorm of controversy has erupted. Here to respond to the Vatican's decision and action here, I'm joined by His Excellency Bishop Joseph Strickland. He joins us from Baltimore. Bishop Strickland, thank you for being here. Despite the recent apostolic visitation of your former diocese ordered by Pope Francis and completed in June, this news of your removal has come as a shock to Catholics. This was the terse statement from the Holy See. We'll put it on the screen. The Holy Father has removed Bishop Joseph E. Strickland from the pastoral care of the Diocese of Tyler, United States of America, and has appointed Bishop Joe Vasquez of Austin, his apostolic administrator. Um, Bishop, th that was the bulletin from the Holy See Press Office. Uh, my question is this. No reason was given in the bulletin, and no official reason for your dismissal has been offered since. Did you have any idea that this was coming before you read the bulletin, and were you personally notified about this, and how? Yes, uh, Raymond, I had a uh, in-person visit in the nuncio's office, uh, the nunciature, last Thursday. Um, and we had a brief meeting where uh, his eminence informed me of uh, really the, the Holy Father's decision. At first, they said, we're, uh, we're requesting that you resign. And I'd made it pretty, very public that I, I felt I couldn't resign. So they simply said, well, then you will be uh, removed. Uh, the letter that I was sent actually said, I was relieved of the responsibilities as Bishop of Tyler, um, an interesting mm. word. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. and I actually didn't see the, the statement in the bulletin, you know, that comes out at noon on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, but that, I was informed uh, in the meeting in person on Thursday, very cordial. Um, His Eminence was, you know, I, it seemed almost a kind of embarrassed to, to share this, but I, I said, I understand. I know it's part of your work uh, to mm -hmm. deliver this kind of message. And uh, so I was informed on Thursday morning, flew back to Dallas and then Tyler, uh, drove to Tyler and got, I was back in the office, had masses as usual, which of course I didn't tell anyone anything. And then I received the, um, by email, an attachment of the letter that said I was relieved of my duties uh, was of, that, as Bishop was, of was Tyler. Was that the papal decree? Was that the, the papal decree that they sent you? Well, yes, yes, yeah. And it, it mm -hmm. gave, it was pretty much what you said on the bulletin, said I'm removed. Bishop Vovask, Joe Vasquez of the Diocese of Austin has been appointed as administrator as they await the naming of the fifth Bishop of Tyler. Did <clears throat> Cardinal Pierre offer any reason for the request for you to retire? Um, or yes, resign he your read, office, rather. read several pages of issues that of concerns and Really, uh, he made it clear that the decisions made, he was just sort of giving me information about what the decision was based on. Um, and it was, 
That, let me say, because there's a lot out there because of some yes. comments even from a priest in the diocese, oh, administrative mm -hmm. concerns. He didn't mention a single administrative concern that, that I mm -hmm. heard. Um, he did mention um, a lack of fraternity with my brother bishops, which mm -hmm. I, I think is basically comes down to a lack of I'm speaking up and they're not, so that has been, yeah, that's been a bit uncomfortable, but they've been very cordial and I've been at various mm -hmm. meetings and at various events. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, the, the fact that I didn't implement uh, traditionis custodis, um, I basically didn't not implement, I just didn't respond. Um, we have a few Latin masses and as I mm -hmm. uh, said, I, I felt like I couldn't deprive that portion of the flock of the nourishment they were receiving. Great young families, mm -hmm. packed to the gills, these churches where, I mean, we have one FSSP church, so that's accurate. I didn't um, implement that. I think other bishops have not responded to that as maybe the right. Vatican wishes. So that was one of the issues. Um, certainly, my internet media, the social media presence, that is, I'd already been told to, to cool it on that. Um, but mm. I, I feel it's important. I'm, you know, I'm a successor of the apostles, and that's a huge responsibility. And I feel the responsibility of speaking the truth as I understand it. I've tried to do so respectfully. I'm not about attacking anyone. I love the church, I love Christ, his church, the Pope Francis, all the, the I mean, we're all uh, bishops, we're all successors of the apostles. We should be working together. So if, if I'm reading this correctly, it was basically breaking fraternity with your fellow bishops. Bishop, this sounds like Bishop Torres, Daniel Torres down in, in Puerto Rico, who was the sole bishop who objected to vaccines being used. And if memory serves, you also uh, were giving your people an option and said you don't have to take the vaccine. It may not be morally licit. Is that correct? Absolutely. I, and, and with the whole COVID situation, um, and that's one of the things that um, wasn't mentioned, but that's where I, I've been on a different page. But I said, we can't mandate people to violate their conscience to to go against their free will. Uh, and that's, you know, that was all in the air during the whole COVID situation. Mm. Um, so, you know, there have been many issues that I've been very clear about that I haven't heard the, the clarity on from other bishops. And, you know, it, it, maybe it's the East Texan in me, maybe it's just, I don't know. But for one thing, Raymond, um, mm -hmm. I, I spend a lot of time in prayer. Uh, that's because I need to. I need to grow closer yeah. to the Lord, and I feel that closeness. And when mm -hmm. ancient truths that Christ proclaimed that are recorded in Scripture that the church has taught for years seem to be up for debate, I've been, I mean, that's one of the things that was listed. I wasn't supportive of the synod. And, you know, I stand by that. Um, as mm. I said in one of the tweets, I said, why are we discussing things that shouldn't be up for discussion? It's yeah. settled truth that God has revealed to us as far as everything I know. And this development that t is talked about, the church needs to change. Change, yes, to grow closer to the sacred heart of Christ, yeah. but to change and reverse direction. That's contrary to the development of doctrine, as I understand it. Let me probe into that question, because some outlets have been reported. <clears throat> when you met with Cardinal Pierre uh, at the Nunciature in Washington, that he said something to you of the effect of, the Holy Father is watching you, and I'm quoting from other periodicals, the Holy Father is watching you, you need to stop talking about the deposit of faith. There is no deposit of faith, end quote. Do you recall an exchange like that? Well, that was from a couple of years ago. And to, to be a little more precise about it, 
I wouldn't say that um, his eminence uh, then, he was archbishop two years ago, but mm -hmm. um, his eminence, uh, Christophe Pierre, basically discounted. Uh, that's the way that I heard it. Discounted the, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, quit emphasizing this deposit of faith so much. It's not what we need to focus on. I, I can't um, quote directly that he said it doesn't exist, but it definitely mm -hmm. wasn't an emphasis, and that's what they were telling me two years ago. Quit emphasizing this so much and get with the program. It's what I heard. I mean, he didn't use those words, but that's what I heard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with this, what happened... Um, uh, a week ago tomorrow, Thursday, last Thursday, uh, his eminence basically said it, it was sort of the, the you didn't get the warning two years ago. Pope Francis has made his decision. You need to be relieved of your work as Bishop of Tyler. I said, I can't resign. Mm -hmm. I said, I would I respect that. The, yes, the Holy Father mm -hmm. as Supreme Pontiff has the authority if he chooses to remove me from that office, um, and he did choose to do so. I respect that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been yeah. gotten advice, oh, you need to stay where you are, you need to fight this. I'm not going to do that. It would, you know, I, yeah. I said I wouldn't. I want to be a man of my word. Mm -hmm. I said, if that's the Holy Father's decision, he has, if anyone has the authority to do it, he does. There is a canonical so process Bishop, that I so no so no evidence of, but he doesn't right. have to, he's above canon law. So So it sounds to me like you had earlier conversations with the nuncio. There were, if you will, warnings about your social media presence, things you were saying. Um, did anyone from the Holy See cite violations of canon law that you may have incurred? To, to get no, this kind no. of penalty. Was, I mean, they don't re remove, you remove a bishop when they're, they're, there's some grave sin, uh, corruption, you know, sexual malfeasance, uh, you know, stealing. Is there anything that they've cited of that magnitude here? No, absolutely not. And really, Raymond, I will just say it. Um, there are many bishops still in their see that are corrupted and connected to the McCarrick scandal that we've never really gotten answers about. And, you know, to me, and it, it's not about me, I, it's about Christ and his church. But to have a situation, um, and some people have mentioned names, I'm not going to mention names, but um, there are bishops that are closely connected, woven into the McCarrick story and mm -hmm. there, there's been no action against them. Um, that, that double standard is troubling, but what's more deeply troubling is, as I said five years ago, do we believe what our Catholic faith teaches or not? I said that on the floor of the bishops' meeting five years ago. Mm -hmm. Sadly, the answer that I seem to be getting, not directly, but by circumstance, by who people are associating with, but what's going on with the Senate, the answer seems to be no. We don't believe that any mm. longer. The church needs to change. Things need to develop. We don't believe what we used to believe. That, I totally disagree. And mm -hmm. that's, I guess, why I'm in the position where I am. There are a lot of lay people and a lot of bishops, I think, uh, certainly whom I've spoken to or encountered in airports on the quiet whispering, who agree with you as well. But they were not certainly speaking with the boldness that you have spoken, uh, Bishop. Let me ask this question. You are in Baltimore. <laughs> the bishops of the United States are meeting there. Why aren't you at the meeting? Why aren't you present at the meeting? You're still a bishop. Well, I was asked not to attend because of the controversy, and I, I certainly <laughs> respected that. I mean, it's, it's a meeting. I mean, I'm not going to beg to go to a meeting. Uh, there's mm. a lot, I mean, it's a lot of work and a lot of time that's spent with, you know, uh, very often it's, it's a whole lot of time and maybe a little bit produced, but, you know, so <laughs> the meeting is not something I was heartbroken to not be at the meeting. I, I respected the, the request that I not attend the meeting because 
it, you know, I, I didn't hear it because, but I presume yeah. because it would have been, and it probably would have been disruptive. I mean, there's work to do, focus on the work. Um, hmm. And I was committed, I mean, you know, I'm sure I'll be criticized for being here in Baltimore, but I had committed to be at a couple of gatherings to pray, like I was at noon mm -hmm. today, to pray a rosary. Yeah. Um, and I said, I'm not going to pull the plug on that because I'm not at the meeting. L let me ask you this. I, I want to take you back for a moment. In June, Pope Francis ordered this apostolic visitation of the diocese. Retired Bishop Gerald Kakanis of <coughs> Tucson and Bishop Dennis Sullivan of Camden led that investigation. Did they meet with you personally during that visit? What did you make of those visitations, by the way? Well, they, they spent uh, from Monday to Friday meeting with people in the diocese. Uh, I, I really, I didn't want to know. I mean, I didn't want a list of names of who they'd met with. Um, so, I, you know, a few people actually mentioned that they met with them. But they met with me the very last on Saturday morning of that week. I'll always remember it was June 24th, the Nativity of John the Baptist. And we met for a little over an hour, and they really raised a lot of the issues, the same issues that the, the nuncio raised when we spoke uh, last Thursday. Um, and we had a very cordial, very calm conversation about my life in the diocese. And hmm. they really, the administrative issues didn't come up at that meeting. That, that word was really brought out by you know, a priest in the diocese who said, oh, there have been administrative issues. Yeah, you know, five years ago, yeah, I made some major changes because mm -hmm. I saw that the direction things were going uh, weren't according to my wishes. And, and I saw that mm -hmm. things were happening that I disagreed with, and I'm the bishop. So I stepped in and said, we need to make mm -hmm. some changes. That was five years ago. It's been pretty stable since. we we surpassed our our goal and hit a record for the bishop's appeal that's the bishop's fundraising for the diocese mm -hmm. for 2023 over three million in pledges um that was a record we've got 20 seminarians fine young men uh, we've had a couple of priests that have been welcomed in the diocese over the past couple of years so the administrative issues it's like there's no there there, as they say. Hmm. Um, yeah. And I mean, I've got a, a good team there, very stable. Uh, yeah, there have been some bumps in the road in 10 years, but nothing that, I mean, we're not going bankrupt. Bishop, they keep trying to spin this as somehow this is mismanagement of the diocese. And I keep asking publicly, I'll ask today, where are the findings? Where is the, the evidence of this? You know, a canonist told uh, the, our Sunday visitor the following. I'll put this up. Uh, he says this removal was administrative. The removal does not of itself entail any wrongdoing. It's just a pastoral judgment that the ministry has become detrimental or ineffective in that particular place. That's Father John Beal, a professor of canon law at CUA. Your response. And did the Holy See communicate that you had mismanaged the diocese to you? No. And uh, I mean, John Beale was one of my professors when I studied canon law. He's a good man. But, uh, you know, to I think to administratively remove a bishop just because, I mean, the pope doesn't like how you're administering the diocese, um, that's pretty serious. And, and I think I encouraged some of the bishops that I have spoken to to, to really look at the question. It's, it's not about me. It's done. Um, but for the future... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's pretty arbitrary. Uh, it's pretty much just in the the Holy Father has that authority, but to to exercise it in that way, I don't think it's the best thing for the church. Um, you know, I'm sure there are people in the Diocese of Tyler that are relieved that this outspoken bishop is gone. There are some that are very sad. There are probably some that are just, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, who's the next bishop? Um, mm -hmm. But I'm going to stay committed to Jesus Christ. 
the deposit of faith that is the treasure that we have. It's good news. I'm not going to, to say, let's go the, down the synodal path and change everything because there's some things that don't change. That's the solidity of our Catholic tradition. And yeah. nobody's going to tell me it's changed. It, it, it's but, like Bishop, reality doesn't change. Mm. Bishop, have you asked for a private audience with Pope Francis to address this decision, to address any personal concerns he might have had with your running the former diocese now? And will, or will you ask for such a meeting? I have no plans to. Um, that may be something that I discern is, is the right thing to do. But the Holy Father has made this decision. Um, clearly, we disagree on some things. Um, and, you know, I just, as I've said, if, if I'm going contrary to the catechism and to the Catholic faith, to the deposit mm -hmm. of faith that we've inherited, please tell me. But I've heard no message like that. I want to be corrected if I'm incorrect. But honestly, Raymond, I feel like it would be less than respectful to the decision that the Holy Father has made. To It, it, it basically is without appeal. And so to give the appearance that I was making an appeal personally, um, you know, I may reach that point, but that's not yeah. in the plans for moving forward for me. I really don't know what the plans are. People have asked me, what are you going to do? I'm going to be faithful to Christ. I'm still going to do my best to be a successor of the apostles. But what that looks like in the future, I don't know. But I, d I don't believe I can just go quietly into the dark night. I mean, I've got mm -hmm. to share the light of Christ in a world that yeah. needs his truth so desperately. Finally, Your Excellency, it has been suggested that in the past you had concerns about the governance of Pope Francis, and in May you tweeted the following that garnered much controversy. It was this, please allow me to clarify regarding Patrick Coffin has challenged the authenticity of Pope Francis. If this is accurate, I disagree. I believe Pope Francis is the Pope but it is time for me to say that I reject his program of undermining that deposit of faith, follow Jesus. That is the quote from uh, May of 2023. Might that have been where the deposit of faith conversation originated with the nuncio? Well, I think that's certainly a part of it. Um, and really, frankly, Raymond, the simple answer that I can give, two years ago, the Vatican, one of the offices clearly said in relation to the, you know, same-sex unions and all of that controversy, the Vatican said, we cannot bless sin. And now, two years later, mm. well, it, we think that's up for debate. No, it's not. Mm. And that's what I mean. That's part of the deposit of faith. That is serving the people of God. That's being a, a successor of the apostles to tell people this is sinful, repent and return to the path of Christ. To say, hmm. oh, well, we don't, we're not sure it's sinful anymore. I do disagree. And I feel obligated before the Lord, before Jesus no. Christ, to say, no, no well, that's not what he yeah, told well, this us. <laughs> yeah, for the average Catholic, whether it's reality or perceived, it feels like it's a whiplash magisterium where what was right last week is now wrong and what was wrong last week is now totally acceptable. And people are just confused. It lends confusion. Uh, I have to ask you this. At a conference in Rome recently, you read uh, a, a letter from, I, I believe you described it as a faithful uh, Catholic on Facebook. Did you know you were going to be relieved of your position when you read that Facebook post? And it contended, suggested, that the Pope may not be legitimate. Do you accept that the Pope is legitimate? Why did you read the letter? I read the letter and, you know, I mean, you, how you read things. But I presented that letter. It was presented to me. 
There was a lot of challenge to me personally in that letter. If you read the whole thing, it's saying, mm -hmm. Bishop, do you want to guard the truth or just keep your job? Um, that was basically mm -hmm. the challenge. And mm -hmm. so the way I read it, it, it used the word usurper, which is very strong. But what mm -hmm. I understood from that letter was that it was saying, and what I was being told is the Pope is using the authority of the chair of Peter to change what Christ has said. And to me, that, that's the nuance that I had. I didn't read it as saying, because like I said, I believe that Pope Francis is the Pope. I mean, there's been no clear statement. I mean, if he's not the Pope, who is? <laughs> um, mm. He is the Pope, uh, but it's a, it's a tragic thing for me to say, I seriously disagree with some of the things that the Holy Father, the man who holds the Petron office in this year, 2023, things that he's saying, and the people that surround him, and I've, I've tried to say that as well, that hmm. certainly the Pope has said confusing things, but a lot of the people that he has appointed as cardinals, the people in the various offices of the Vatican, they haven't said confusing things. They've said things that contradict the deposit of faith. And the Pope has put them in place. So it really, it frustrates me. If he disagrees with what they're saying, he's the Pope. He can clear it up very quickly, very simply, and say, mm. this is what we believe as Catholics. I pray that he will do that. Your Excellency Bishop Joseph Strickland, we will leave it there. I thank you for the time. We will certainly uh, keep you in our prayers, and uh, we look forward to what you do next. Thank you for the time. <laughs> Thanks, Roman. That's a difficult interview. And the Christmas season is upon us, thank goodness. Christmas Marion Bright has landed on the Billboard Jazz and Christmas charts and remains the number one jazz release on Amazon. But more importantly, it's a sign of joy in a dark time to so many, certainly to me and to so many people who've reached out to me. You can get your copy at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Music, Spotify, the EWTN catalog, or wherever you get your music. And I can't wait to have you and your family join us for what I think of as a live family reunion on the concert tour. We're kicking it off in days on Saturday, November 25th in Phoenix, Arizona, Sunday, December 3rd in Dallas at the House of Blues with Jose Feliciano, Friday, December 8th in Tampa at the Straws Center, Friday, December 15th in Cleveland with Frankie Avalon and the grand finale on Thursday, December 21st at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. And we have some incredible surprise guests. You don't want to miss this. Go to RaymondRoyalChristmas.com for the links to the tickets. Please tell your family and friends and get those tickets before they run out. It's going to be something, and I don't want you to miss this, and it'll make your Christmas merry and bright. Now with reaction to my conversation with Bishop Joseph Strickland, I'm joined by the papal posse editor-in-chief of the CatholicThing.org, Robert Royal, and canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Gentlemen, um, I want to get your reaction to what you just heard from Bishop Strickland. Uh, Father Jerry, as a canonist, your thoughts on the fact that the bishop and the church have yet to really be given a fulsome reason for the removal, though it's clear the bishop was informed of uh, at least what that report revealed, and for the first time we heard him tell us what those reasons were. Well, yeah, this is uh, highlighting uh, the canonical irregularity of what went on here, just from a procedural point of view. Uh, he said that he got essentially, uh, he got an email letter which said essentially what the bulletin of the, the Daily Bulletin of the Vatican said, which is that he's been relieved of the, of the diocese. Uh, he said that reasons were given to him uh, by the nuncio, Cardinal Pierre, uh, which included that he had lacked fraternity with his fellow bishops, uh, that he didn't support the synod on synodality, uh, also mentioned was the Latin Mass. Uh, other things were mentioned because uh, he didn't give an exhaustive list, Bishop Strickland. But you know, let's just go back to this. Uh, it is not a canonical offense not to, to always agree with your fellow bishops. Uh, St. John right. Fisher showed that uh, in the time of Henry VIII. Mm. Uh, as regards implementing the prohibitions on the Latin Mass, 
Well, bishops have to make decisions on how they're going to figure out how to help people in their diocese. He mentioned he has a fraternity of St. Peter Parish. They're not subject to traditionis custodis. They can continue their activities. Uh, so that was, that was troubling. But really what's troubling is all of that should have been set down in a document so that the people of Tyler would know this from the mouth of the authority that's emanating this decision, the Pope and uh, his nuncio. They owe it to uh, the people of Tyler to say, your bishop did the following things which required the pope in his judgment to relieve him of duties. Now, reports, as you yeah. mentioned in the interview very well, Raymond, people were saying, well, he has administrative irregularities. Well, he said the nuncio never mentioned anything like that, and the visitators never mentioned anything like that. I've never heard any report in the press that he was mismanaging his diocese. He averted to no. the fact there were disagreements or some decisions. Well, guess what? No bishop gets 100 percent agreement on things he does. That's, again, not a reason to remove him. Hmm. Bob, uh, we have seen quite a few occasions in which Pope Francis has used his prerogative to remove bishops. Bishop Martin Holly, formerly of Memphis, uh, Bishop Daniel Fernandez Torres, I mentioned him in Puerto Rico, come to mind. Do you see a pattern in these removals? Well, Raymond, I just think that, you know, we're, we're digging for reasons that could be published, that could be listed, and, and could reasonably mm -hmm. be, be debated. I think it just comes down to the fact that the Holy Father, at a certain point, thought that he was kind of a thorn in the side. That's just my own kind of global reading of what happened here, because mm -hmm. it, it kind of beggars belief that um, the one outspoken, the very outspoken bishop here in the United States, uh, among over 200 other bishops, happens to be the one guy whose administration calls for his removal from office. We, we know that all sorts of problems exist in other dioceses as well. As, as far right. as the Latin Mass is concerned, a, a priest friend of mine pointed out to me recently that 100 dioceses in the United States did not implement Traditionis Custodis as it was requested to be implemented, including Boston, in which the Boston Cathedral, Chardon, uh, Cardinal Sean O'Malley is very close to the Holy Father, um, even there it has not been implemented in the way that it was requested. Now, it, you know, I, I think that at, at certain points, even for me, uh, I think the bishop made some mistakes in that uh, tweet that he put out in May where he said that the pope is the pope. He admitted that his election was legitimate, but I reject mm -hmm. the, his undermining of the, the foundations of the faith. Reject is a strong word. He would have been, I think, mm. it, it, much more prudent without being uh, not outspoken to use some idea about I disagree or I think what he's doing is undermining. That said, mm. what it basically comes down to in the end, I, I, I believe, is just, just the Holy Father kind of figures that he's not my guy. He, I don't think he understands because people in Rome don't understand the United States that Texas is a conservative place. And to be a plain speaker yeah. in Texas is different than be, to be a plain speaker in, say, Milan. So I, I think he was entirely appropriate, probably misspoke a couple of times. But if we're going to look for a cause, I think that the cause is, is simply that the pope is, is he, he resents well, the way our bishops have resisted him. And this was a good mm. opportunity one week before the bishops are meeting in Baltimore to make yeah. a point. Yeah. No, no. This was a this was clearly a warning shot, you know, meant to meant to uh, get everybody's attention. Get with the program, guys. That was the that's clearly what's the message here. Father, you made a great point uh, in your last answer, and it, it concerned requiring the people of God to know why you're removing their shepherd. We're, ta we're, we're on this synodal path where we're walking with people and we're listening to people. How about talking to the people and telling them why, you, why you're doing the things you're doing, like removing their bishop? But tell me about the canonical requirements here. And is it not a denial of due process to uh, fail to give reasons for that dismissal, clear reasons, canonical reasons for removing a bishop in this way? Yes, uh, this has to do with the specifics of canon law regarding the office of a bishop. And uh, he is subject to canonical sanction if he commits a canonical crime. Uh, he could also be subject to privation of office if there was some serious matter that wasn't specifically covered in a canonical crime, but nonetheless uh, was a great offense against the unity of the church or 
uh, the proper administration of his diocese, uh, things of that sort. If he were judged to be either psychologically or physically impaired, he could be removed for that reason. Uh, that's all reasonable. But let's get down to the point here. If you are going to essentially punish a man for things that he's done, those things should be clearly stated. They should be laid out. The law under which you punish him or, or think of punishing him should be also specified. And he needs the right of self-defense. The idea that you, since you send some visitators and they met with him for an hour after the, uh, after the end of the meeting, and then the next time he, he gets an official communication, apparently, is when the nuncio calls him in and says, please resign, and these are the reasons. This is not a canonically proper procedure. If the Holy Father th wanted to convene a trial because he committed a canonical crime, please do that. An administrative process is an alternate means, but an administrative process, you have the right to read the evidence that's been gathered against you. For instance, did the visitators make a re written report, and was that ever shown to Bishop uh, Strickland so he could review those findings and then uh, offer a different interpretation? There's no indication of that. Uh, the Holy Father no. didn't call him in to clarify anything that the Holy Father was concerned about. Uh, this is not how you should treat a successor of the apostles. In Vatican II, it's made quite clear that the office of bishop is not to be treated as a branch manager delegation from uh, the Roman pontiff. In other words, they're not there uh, sort of like monsignors. Monsignors are appointed by the pope, and he can remove the monsignor if he, if he wants to, and they're basically subject to the pope. We're all subject to the Pope as the supreme authority. I don't deny that. I never would. But the supreme authority is also fits into the nature of the apostolic college, which is a successor mm -hmm. to the apostles. And the apostles were given office by Christ himself. So are their successors. That's not being respected in practice here. Yeah. Uh, it, it, there are many things that are disturbing about this case. Um, not only... It looks like the report or bits of the report were shared with him as he was told he was being removed from the diocese and not in advance. And in a time of mercy, we keep hearing about mercy. Look, we've got sexual uh, 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 abusers and, and, and miscreants running all over the Vatican, okay? Some still wearing miters. And nobody does anything. In fact, we move them from place to place. We, we get them reincarnated somewhere, and then we move them back into position. And yet, this guy, who may have spoken out of turn, may have said something that was even inflammatory to, to some in the Vatican, he's, tr you know, it's like off with his head. Instantly, no mercy, no correction, no room for improvement. I don't see how that helps anything. And I also don't see how it helps the Catholic in the pew in his diocese. But back in September, former head of the Vatican's doctrinal office, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, had this to say about Bishop Strickland's apostolic visitation. Here's what he said. Yes, it is, a, it is terrible what's being done to Bishop Strickland, an abuse of office against the divine right of the episcopate. If I could advise Bishop Strickland, he should not resign under any circumstances because then they can wash their hands of it. A bishop can only be deposed by the Pope according to the commandment of justice if he has been guilty of something bad, heresy, schism, apostasy, a crime, or totally unpriestly behavior. And e.g., e the pseudo-blessing of people of both sexes in extramarital relations, which insults God and cheats people of their salvation. That's the quote. Actually, there are a number of cardinals, certainly in Germany, doing just that. Nobody says a word. In fact, they, they're, they're welcomed into the papal palace. Father, the cardinal, and, or Bob, I'll go to you. The cardinal speaks of a crime of some sort being necessary to justify the removal of a bishop. Where is the crime in this case? Yeah, I, I, th I think you need a microscope to find where, where the crime is. And, and you're quite right to point out that we have quite open uh, flaunting of, of rules from Rome. We have a bishop in Germany, as you rightly say, who's already instructed his priests that they are allowed, uh, if they wish, to, to uh, if they, they judge it appropriate, to bless uh, uh, same-sex couples. Look, the very cardinal who's been running the synod on synodality, Cardinal Holerich, came out a couple of years ago and said that modern science has demonstrated that the church's teaching on homosexuality is wrong, which is already absurd. And then he affirmed that the Holy Father believes the same thing. Now, if you want to look at somebody who's being doctrinally wild, 
you would look at a, a mm -hmm. statement like that, and there, were, there should have been a correction from, from Rome saying, no, the Holy Father obviously would never believe such a thing. It's contrary right. to Catholic teaching. But yet Cardinal Hollerich just went on his merry way. We never heard a, a peep out of the Vatican, and he's been running the, the Synod on Synodality for the past couple of years. So, look, we, we can, we can uh, drive ourselves crazy trying to find some rational account for this. But I think we know that it, what it boils down to is he, he was, was a, an outspoken person who, who has a different point of view about where the future of the, the, the church ought to go. And in his diocese, it may be slightly different because we, we believe that there ought to be a, a, a diversity within unity in this Catholicity. So I just to, just to me, it seems uh, unfair. The Pope has a right to do it, but you, 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 won't, you really want to say, Holy Father, really don't. This doesn't help you with Catholics in the United States. Mm, yeah. Bishop Athanasius Schneider is really one of the few bishops who have come out vocally uh, about this situation. He claims that this is a purge of traditionalists. Here's his quote. He quoted, put this on uh, X the other day. The one charge which is now sure to secure severe punishment, he's quoting St. Basil here, is the careful keeping of the traditions of the fathers. The deposition of the Bishop of Tyler, his Excellency Joseph Strickland, signifies a black day for the Catholic Church of our day. We are witnessing a blatant injustice towards a bishop who did his duty in preaching and defending with paresia the immutable Catholic faith and morals and in promoting the sacredness of the liturgy. That's Bishop Athanasius Schneider. Uh, he wrote that on November 12th. Father, your thoughts on Bishop Schneider's defense, and does this put him on the chopping block? Well, he's similar to Bishop Strickland in that he's both outspoken and media savvy in the sense that he's, you know, conversing with all the modern means to communicate with the faithful throughout the world, which, by the way, is part of what Vatican II said is what bishop's responsibility. His, he's not simply to be responsible for his diocese. He also has to have a concern for the whole church. And that's what these bishops have mm -hmm. done. They're not the only ones. Uh, there are many bishops out there who are doing good things in this regard. But, you know, Bishop Schneider's essential point is correct. Someone who defends vigorously the doctrine of the faith is persecuted. As you mentioned, and Bob just mentioned, these different bishops who contradict it. I was completely stunned to read that Bishop Johann Boni of Antwerp recently endorsed euthanasia, mercy killing, uh, in certain cases. This is a direct contradiction of the Ten Commandments. This is a Catholic bishop telling people that it is a good thing to murder people who are either old or sick. Now, can you imagine under any other pope that that would not go contradicted and that bishop would not be called in and reprimanded and called to recant that? I mean, this is outrageous. I can't express the, my anger enough, and I think that's the, an appropriate reaction, by the way. A bishop is sent mm -hmm. by Jesus to go out and preach the gospel. This man is preaching what the Nazis did, which is euthanasia. That's one of the biggest things. Bishop von Galen, who is now, I believe, Blessed von Galen, protested against euthanasia policy in Nazi Germany. He's a hero yes. for that. The bishop in Antwerp yes. is now sitting there in his Episcopal residence telling people it is okay to kill people who are sick or old. This is an outrage. Bishop Strickland doesn't deserve to be removed. Bishop Bonney, if he doesn't recant, he should be removed. Now, it's sad to say we've come to this point, but this is the chaos that we're dealing with right now. Yeah. Uh, I want to return to that apostolic visitation of Bishop Strickland in Tyler. Uh, Bishop Gerald Kakanis, I mentioned him earlier, formerly of Tucson, he seemed an odd choice to lead this type of investigation, given his controversial ordination of a man, a student in his seminary, who turned out to be a serial abuser, and he allegedly knew of the charges against the guy, and he ordained him anyway. Uh, Bob, your thoughts on this visitation? I mean, it seemed the, the, the rig was in from the beginning, given the people conducting the visitation. Yeah, I don't have to confess, I don't really know very much about the two uh, bishops. I did know that about Bishop mm -hmm. Kikanis, uh, but we have yeah. to assume that they were selected for a reason, because they would come back with some material. Um, we, we've heard certain reports that when after they uh, they did the visitation, their judgment that 
the, uh, that Bishop Strickland's continuing as Bishop of Tyler, Texas, was no longer tenable, I think is what they, uh, the word that they used. Mm -hmm. So, um, look, you, you can obviously produce whatever outcome you want by choosing pe people to conduct a, a process like this. But I agree with Father entire, entirely. The way you prevent uh, an injustice from taking place is th this is why we have canon law in the first place. This is why we have secular law in the first place. We are not run by, by a, a government of men. Now, we do have to respect the Holy Father has, has special uh, authority from God himself, but we, don't, we yeah. prefer not to be, be governed by an, a, a, an order of men, but rather by a legal process that makes sure that there's fairness to everyone. It's quite clear to me that there was no fairness here, whatever they think they, they say they may have discovered in that diocese. And, and, and Father, there is this mismanagement or misgoverning narrative that has been uh, set in motion as the reason for Bishop Strickland's removal. We heard today that that really is not the case at all. In fact, he wasn't even, it wasn't even suggested that such a thing was going on. But as I mentioned earlier, you have that Father John Beale, the canonist at CUA, who says that this is an administrative, not a punitive action. Um, and now Austin Ivory, the Pope's biographer, has weighed in. He put this up. The narrative that Strickland and his supporters are deploying that he was removed for what he believed and preached is denied by the facts. That was, this was an administrative, not a penal act. Uh, Strickland misgoverned his diocese and has been removed for the good of the faithful, Austin Ivory says. First of all, uh, Father, how does Ivory know this and what are the facts here? Well, we've learned the facts from the man himself. Uh, Christophe Pierre, Cardinal Christophe Pierre, never mentioned mismanagement as a reason for his removal. Uh, now, regarding uh, Father Beale's uh, opinion about administrative removal, uh, that's a conjecture, and he himself admits in that interview that there is no procedure, meaning there's nothing been written. There is no canons about removing bishops administratively. There are canons about removal and transfer of pastors. It's the, the final section of the Code of Canon Law. Those are called administrative mm. proceedings, and they're done because the bishop judges that that priest is either needed to be serving in another parish where his talents can be used, or that his talents, he doesn't have enough talents in the particular parish where he is, and therefore he has to go somewhere else. Uh, there is no administrative removal, meaning that this has nothing to do with anything substantive. It's simply a judgment by the uh, bishop, uh, the pope, that he, Bishop uh, Strickland can serve better somewhere else. In fact, he's not been given a new assignment. So it's not, can't be viewed in, in light of that earlier code, uh, the, the code procedures regarding pastors. So, you know, the pope, it, it, this is a big question, people say, is the pope an absolute monarch? No, he's a monarch. He is uh, the giver, the lawgiver. But he himself is subject to the divine law, the natural law. And if we're going to have canonical order in the church, then he should follow the procedures that he himself uh, is obliged to by the fact that the Code of Canon Law does not claim an exemption from all the procedural matters uh, simply because you're pope. And this, we've seen this with decrees. The bishop mentioned that he got a letter. A letter is not a decree. A decree has a formal character mm -hmm. in canon law. It enacts a provision of law. It states summarily, if necessary, the reason for that precision, a provision, and then it's guaranteed to be given by the authority uh, who, ought, who issued it, in this case, the pope. So, you know, the, can the pope exempt himself from giving decrees? Sure he can, but he needs to tell us he's done that. In this case, we're just basically getting, it's sort of like getting a telegram in the old days. You open the telegram and find out, you know, something happened. Well, uh, <laughs> that's not how bishops should be treated. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, the, the whole thing is wacky, let's face it. And look, I, I'm sure uh, we're targeted now and will be targeted for daring to even speak of this because this is the truth. We're, we're, we're putting the whole thing out there, the good, the bad, and the ugly, what was said, what wasn't said, and the fact that there are a lot of oversights here. But here's where it all comes down to for me. And this story leapt out at me, and I want your quick reaction to it. We're almost out of time. Uh, the bishop of the Diocese of Brooklyn earlier this month Robert Brennan issued a letter citing an alarming statistic. This is what everything we've talked about since this show started, and really in the last 27 or 28 years, is about. There has been a 40 percent decline in mass attendance in the Diocese of Brooklyn over the last five years. Bob, this is not the only diocese where this decline has been reported. Why do you think this is happening now? 
Well, look, we can hope, hopefully say a large part of that had something to do with what happened during COVID. But there's clearly something else. I mean, they, all the, the studies that are being done of mass attendance in the United States show, um, a, a, in some cases, slow, but steady erosion of the practice of the faith. Something like 70 percent of so-called Catholics in the United States never darken the door of a church. Of the 30 percent who do, maybe 25 percent actually do kind of show up on a, on a weekly basis. But these things are declining. And it means that there's something that, that is missing in, in uh, the church's outreach. Uh, one of the statements that uh, Cardinal Pierre made to America magazine uh, the last week before this uh, bishop's uh, uh, meeting started is that nobody goes to church in the United States. Now, that, this is preposterous. He's been here seven years. He ought to know s something more about that. But it is true that there is a, a, a continuing erosion. And rather than talking internally about, you, you know, listening to one another and, and, and synodality, we really need to be out talking about the gospel, that, that we're not simply a church of listening. We're a church that is a teaching church as well. And we've had 40, 50 years of very poor catechesis, and it shows up in those statistics about what's happening in mass mm -hmm. attendance. Yeah, well, Father, these statistics predate COVID, five years. It's a five-year decline, not, to, not a, a, a three-year or a two-year decline. Five years, 40 percent drop-off. If that holds, you're going to have like four people left in the pews. How can you keep churches open? You know, what, what do you think are the root causes here? Is it this confusion? Is it this double speak, this back and forth? You know, you can you can uh, uh, have uh, tr transgendered people baptized, but don't join the Freemasons. I mean, this is like within a week what we got from the divine office. Yeah, those statistics are very disturbing. I was born in Brooklyn. I was baptized in Brooklyn, St. Charles Borromeo Parish in Brooklyn Heights. Uh, Brooklyn's dear to me. Uh, but this is a sign that is widespread in the U.S. It is sad to say, uh, after the council, the council never intended any of this. The council was about renewing the faith and bringing people closer to Christ. But after the council, many people took it to be this. Catholicism used to be a difficult religion with a lot of demands. Now we're going to make it easy. Well, the first thing that people got in their mind was, oh, I don't have to go to church every Sunday, get some more sleep in. Now, that has, not, has you know, trickled down over time, and then combined it with a lack, you know, the Catholic school system in the United States is in collapse, uh, at least in, you know, areas such as where I live in the East. I mean, they were closing yeah. schools all the time, and without religious women to teach, uh, often Catholic schools, the religion program is not what it used to be. So, lack of training, lack of seriousness, treating religious obligations as your choice rather than something that... You know, you're required. We are required to worship God. OK, let's put it. This is something that the American Simply. mentality, the American mentality is I'll choose to do what I want, even regarding God. And the Catholic Church always said, stop, full stop. You can choose, you know, white bread or rye bread. You can't choose whether you're going to worship God. A lot of people have that in mind. And we have to contradict. We have to say, look, folks. If you don't get down on your knees every Sunday and pray at Mass, you're not fulfilling your obligation as a Catholic, and you're certainly not going to grow deeper in your faith. So the bishops mm -hmm. and priests like me, we all have a challenge to change this trend. But, you know, baptisms are down, confessions. Catholic marriages are collapsing in the United States, the number of people yeah. seeking marriage. You know, cohabitation is a thing unheard of among Catholics in the 50s, is now the most common practice. These are real challenges. Our bishops need to tackle them. Well, it's also helpful, I think, if we don't target the faithful and the good Catholics who are attending Mass, who want a reverent, sacred Mass, to say, we're shutting that down and sending you to the gym or go to a fire station and say Mass wherever you can with your children and your wife. This is, this is madness. I'm sorry. We've entered a, a season of madness. We cannot target the faithful, nor can we target faithful bishops. And when that is done, it's no wonder the flock scatters, and I think that's what we're seeing. And that is a bitter pill for everyone, every Catholic, to swallow, no matter where you are on the spectrum. Gentlemen, I'm going to have to leave it there. I wish we could go for another hour, but they won't give me a special. So this is it. You get one hour a week, that's it. For commentary and podcasts by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray, visit thecatholicthing.org. Thank you for being here, gents. And I'm thrilled that The Magnificent Mischief of Tad Lincoln is available at bookstores everywhere. 
It really is the story of a son who gave his father a glimmer of joy in an otherwise dark landscape. And it's also the origin story of a great national holiday tradition, the White House Turkey Pardon, which is coming up. Families just love it. I think yours will, too. It's available now at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, the EWTN catalog, wherever books are sold. Visit RaymondArroyo.com for all the details. That is all the time we have for now. Next week is Thanksgiving, and sadly, we won't have a show. But I want to wish you and your families a blessed and wonderful holiday. Be sure to catch us. Thursday, November 30th, I have an exclusive interview with Pope Benedict's former secretary, Archbishop Georg Gonswain. You don't want to miss that. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.